So Barb asks, what is your take on resistant starches? Seems like everyone is on the bandwagon about refrigerating their potatoes to turn their starch resistant. But from what I've gleaned from reading your articles and listening to you and Mike, this may not be ideal. And so I think we would largely agree with Barb. Um, and we'll get into the details. Of course, there's always nuance, but there are definitely concerns when it comes to resistant starch. And so just to kind of back up a little bit, when we're talking about resistant starch, the resistance piece is referring to resistance to digestion. So this means that the starch basically changes in conformation or doesn't change. And we'll explain that into a way where it becomes resistant to our digestion. So instead of it being broken down into its individual molecules of glucose and then absorbed, it basically passes through undigested and feeds the microbes that are in our gut. Now, if we have a very healthy microbiome, that might be fine. Although I think it's so questionable as to how much we want to be feeding them with resistant starch. But if we don't have a healthy microbiome, then I definitely think I would be very, 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 very weary of this because you're basically just going to be feeding harmful bacteria and other potentially pathogenic microbes. So that's just kind of the starting place. But there's two main reasons why resistant starch is typically suggested. Firstly, is due to these possible gut effects or the effects on the gut that are supposed to be beneficial, right? It's supposed to help feed bacteria in a beneficial way. And then the other is that basically it converts the usable carbohydrate into unusable carbohydrate. So we don't digest it. So you get less carbohydrate actually coming through and being absorbed. And therefore you get less of a blood sugar spike and less of a glycemic effect. And of course, this coming from the perspective that less carbs, less blood sugar is better. And we've gone over time and time again why that's not the case. And so from that perspective, I think we can kind of fully ignore that reason as far as resistance starch goes. But then the next question is about the gut effects in a bit more detail. And so we'll get into those in a moment, but just to kind of be clear in case anyone's unsure, there's a few different suggestions for how to increase or get resistant starch. One is by eating basically raw starch. So this is often sometimes as a supplement, maybe people are actually eating these things. I don't know, but normally green bananas and raw potatoes and some other like raw starchy foods are suggested here. And you're basically getting raw non-cooked starch that we don't absorb. And so it just feeds bacteria. And then the other way that people are getting raw starch again, outside of a supplement would be by cooking these starchy foods like potatoes or rice and then cooling it. And that will increase, or it basically changes the conformation of the starch into a more undigestible form. It is worth mentioning, it's not like we're talking about all of the starch being changed. It's actually a pretty small portion that will become resistant starch. There's already some built in, even when the food is cooked, there's always going to be a little bit of resistant starch. And then when it's cooled, that amount increases by a bit. It's not a huge difference, but it does increase. A couple of things to mention on that front is... Well, actually, before I go to that, I'll, I'll let you hop in, Mike, if there's anything you want to mention, just kind of overview-wise. I think the first question, and maybe I have a bias here, but who wants to eat cold potatoes or cold rice? Like, if I'm going to have man. rice and potatoes, <laughs> I want them nice and hot with some butter on them. Yeah, but we're talking about sacrifices here. We're not talking about what tastes better. We're talking about the things that we do to improve our health, right? Jump in the ice path, take a bite out of your raw potato. Like this is for our health. Like, I don't know. I don't know why that even matters. What, what does taste have to do with this? Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess I just come from an entirely different world, but for me, like I want a nice piece of steak with some, some potatoes hot out of the oven or some freshly made mashed potatoes, or maybe some like a nice chicken with some with some rice and some butter on it. That, that sounds pretty good to me. I don't know about this, this cold rice, cold potato stuff. You know, Mike, I, we might start getting some questions about chicken now. Of course, we're talking about lean chicken that's low in PUFA, but you know, I know you've mentioned in the past, you've been pretty hard on chicken, not really a fan. So we'll have to maybe talk about if your taste buds have changed or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think a little bit of tomato sauce and ketchup makes pretty much everything. <laughs> So let me, with let, a sophisticated me, palate. let me, let me just, uh, let me just adjust this. It's chicken and ketchup with rice and butter is top, top quality meal right there. And yeah, yeah. I can make it. <laughs> <laughs> Mike the chef. Yes, that is. I'm chef coming Mike. out with a cookbook. Everybody stay tuned for yeah, recipes right. on chicken and ketchup and rice and butter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, definitely a good point. Not something that we would normally be eating, not something that I think, and it, there's, it's worth mentioning, like physiologically, we are not inclined to eat 
green bananas raw or potatoes raw. I mean, that or cooled either. I mean, I think most people would not prefer that taste. And it's pretty counter and you don't see any animals with similar digestive systems to ours doing that. So, uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, overall, from my perspective, it, and this comes mo- largely from working with people, I think in some clients that I've worked with, the resistant starch has been beneficial for the microbiome and for their gut function. However, not necessarily getting it through like adding raw plantain, green plantain fiber or, or powder or raw potato starch to their, to their meals or shakes or something like this. More so just that they tend to do well with some of these starchy foods in their diet and they find that it improves their digestion. And that alone will provide you, you know, resistant starch is one type of fiber, but you're getting a variety of other fibers from potatoes, from plantains, et cetera, with the polyphenol compounds. And a lot of people or a portion of people do well with adding these in to improve their digestive function. And then some people who have a harder time with just doing sugars alone, maybe they do a little bit better with starches, will also tend to do better with these foods. So the way I come at this is there are research studies showing tons of benefit um, for lowering endotox and lowering in inflammation in certain animal models and in certain volunteers. But then I also have, and, and so in that population of people, I think that the resistant starch could be beneficial. But again, I wouldn't start supplementing tons of this raw potato fiber, or plantain fiber. I would just say have plantains or potatoes in your diet. And then in terms of the... And eating them cooked or are you suggesting... No, to, to, to cook them, to eat the, like, yeah. just eat them on a regular basis. And then don't, if you don't have a negative response to having your potatoes, like making your potatoes or batch cooking your potatoes, putting them in the fridge, and then the next day you just heat them up quickly. I don't know, you're using the microwave or you heat them up in the pan really quick. I wouldn't freak out about resistant starch if you don't have a negative response from it. If you're not having bloating, if you're not having gas, if you're not having rashes, if you're not having weird, crazy dreams at night when you're having these reheated potatoes, then whatever, it just doesn't, I don't think that it's that big of a deal. However, there is a portion of clients who I have worked with who have really negative reactions to the resistant starches and to some of these like uh, cooled and reheated starches, bloating, gas, joint pains, things like this. I'm one of the people who don't do well with it at all. So in those circumstances, I actually wouldn't try to eat the resistant starch, especially supplements on a regular basis if you're having that happen. And just as an example of this, because there's, there's not necessarily direct studies on people having such a bad time with this, although there, there are some symptoms in the studies where people talk about bloating and gas from the resistant starch fibers, but there's, a, there's autoimmune disease ankylosing spondylitis, and it's attributed to or linked to an overgrowth of Klebsiella pneumonia in the gut. If you're somebody who is getting these joint pains or the, spinal, the pains along their spine, and again, this is, this is an extreme example of this, when you're having starches, resistant starch is probably not going to be a good thing in this circumstance. So The reason I'm bringing this up is I'm trying to highlight a specific example where this would be problematic so we don't just have a blanket recommendation for people to go out and eat raw potato starch or raw plantain starch. So the way I kind of see it is as a spectrum. If you don't have a problem with it, it's fine, and maybe it helps you. Add plantains, potatoes, things like this in your diet. You know, rice, you could batch cook it, put it in the fridge, and then when you want to eat your meals, it makes life easier to just heat it up instead of having to cook rice fresh every time. That's what's going on? Great. Then that's the direction I would go no problem. If you do have a bit of problem, but it's not terrible when you're, when you're uh, eating these, some of these starch sources, then try to cook it fresh. So try to have your potatoes fresh, try to have your rice fresh. If you're going to make some plantains, fry them up fresh instead of letting them cool and then reheating them. And then the last part is if you have serious gut issues and you really don't do well with starches, then I would just stay away for a period of time until you're able to modulate the gut effectively. So there's really a spectrum of options that are available to you to manage whether or not you do well with resistant starch or starches in general. And I think I would, from an implementation standpoint, try to determine where you fall in that spectrum and then adjust accordingly instead of trying to go about adding in this resistant starch in your diet because some blogger writes that it's the best thing since sliced bread <laughs> and then start to get a variety of digestive issues. And, you know, you're doing this for two weeks down the line. You're still getting bloated and gassy and having all these problems and just trying to push through because maybe you'll adjust over time. I would say nix it. 
And there's a bunch of other fiber options that don't have to be supplements that you can incorporate into your diet and still modulate the microbiome and have a beneficial effect. There's a variety of different cooked vegetables you can use. There's a variety of fruits that you can use and all the different polyphenol compounds and herbs are also beneficial as well. So again, this is like one strategy. I don't think everybody has to use it and I would adjust based on your individual context. Yeah, definitely. And, and so I think there's two things I would highlight. One is we can use our symptoms to tell us in most cases how we're responding. And so if we're eating, as you said, anything along that spectrum, and we'll go back through that. But if you're eating something on that spectrum and you're finding that you're not responding well, then we would want to shift toward more easily digestible, something that's less likely to feed the, the microbiome and continue to adjust based on how you're responding. As you said, bloating and gas are really clear, brain fog, joint pain, skin issues, autoimmune issues. Those could all fall into the category here as well. So that's kind of the main thing we would want to use as our indicator. And as you said, we have the spectrum. So we have the most resistant starch, which would be raw. And so normally when you're doing that, you're talking about a very small dose supplement. You're not normally eating an entire green banana or an entire <laughs> you know, raw potato. And then you would have the cooked and cooled, which is going to have the next most resistant starch. Then you have the cooked, cooled, and reheated. When it's reheated, it helps to reduce the resistant starch, especially if it's being reheated at a high enough temperature. Typically about 175 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature you would want the food to get to in order to uh, reduce the resistant starch again. It's still, well, and now it gets to the next one on the spectrum, which is just cooked and eaten fresh. So cooked, cooled, and reheated has less resistant starch than cooked and cooled, but it still has a bit more in most cases relative to just cooked and eaten fresh. So if you're eating that starch, the, you know, the, let's say potatoes or rice, freshly cooked, that's going to have the least amount of resistant starch relative to the other ones. And then we have the other option, which is no starch. And of course, that won't have any resistant starch. It's also worth mentioning that there can be other reasons why someone might have issues consuming starch that are not the resistant starch itself. Yep. Even regular starch can be difficult to digest. You have to basically have enough of the enzyme that breaks down the starch all the way in order to get it to the individual glucose molecules to then absorb and use it. You might have issues with that. A lot of them might come with different types of fibers, other fermentable carbohydrates outside of resistant starch that can cause issues. A lot of them might come with anti-nutrients if we're talking about grains, especially the whole grains or legumes. So there's a many reasons why someone might not well do with, might not do well with starchy foods, but when it comes to resistant starch, that's kind of the way I would lay it out. When it does, and again, just to be clear, like if we wanted to avoid resistant starch, at least we would want to be cooking the food and eating it warm. If it's fresh, that's great. If it's reheated, normally it's still reduced enough, unless we're very sensitive. It's worth trying either way. If you're really not sensitive and you like cold potatoes in a potato salad, go ahead and try it. But it, just keep in mind, it will have more resistant starch. And if your microbiome is off, it's going to be more likely to cause issues. And I've definitely seen that happen specifically with something like potato salad and people who have gut issues. So something to keep in mind there for sure. The last thing I would want to mention is the type of starch that's in the food can also contribute to the amount of resistant starch. So there's typically two main types of starch. We have amylose, which is just a long chain of glucose, like a single uh, kind of simple chain, versus amylopectin, which is a branched uh, starch molecule that has glucoses, but it's branched out. The branched one, the amylopectin, is typically easier to digest and also less likely to convert to resistant starch relative to amylose. We talked about this a little bit very early on in the podcast, so I'll link to those episodes. I think it was the ones talking about gut health and digestion. But if you choose, let's say, the shorter grain rice, those have more amylopectin relative to amylose, so they'll produce less resistant starch compared to the long grain rice. Plus, even if we're not even talking about resistant starch, the amylopectin is typically easier to digest rather than the amylose. This is also why we talked about the waxy potatoes, you know, the new potatoes, the smaller ones, as opposed to something like russets, which are higher in amylose. So I'll refer back to that episode for more information there, but it's just another consideration here. And uh, yeah, I think that would be my main thoughts here when it comes to resistant starch. But of course, most people that are looking to use resistant starch, they're looking to do so in order to improve their gut health. Maybe they're looking to lose weight or improve their metabolism as well. But as we're getting at, it's not really the ideal place to focus. 